let's get into what we mean by Instagram faith. You probably have a friend, or you are that friend, on social media that posts about a trip for like 36 weeks in a row, right? They go for three days, but they take enough pictures that you think they're there for like 36 weeks, and you're like, man, I wish I had the money to be in Ireland my whole life and not work, but that's not actually what's the case. In reality, they're only there like four days. In the picture they took, they had to like shove everyone aside, you know, and say, excuse me, excuse me, we need a picture. They take the picture, and then they're still 40 feet back from whatever they're trying to see. It looks really cool in the picture, but in reality, it's a little different. Or you have that friend that takes a picture with their family, and they have multiple children, and everyone's smiling in the picture. What you don't know is they sent that to a Photoshopper to mix different pictures together to make it look like everyone was smiling at the same time. Because if you have kids, that never happens. More than one kid. They, never, they tend to feed off each other, and, and one smiles, and one's looking at the frog in the back. So let's talk about Instagram versus reality. So I have a few pictures. Okay, what I mean by, if you don't know Instagram, Instagram is where you post a picture of something and you can caption it. Okay, so I'm going to show you pictures that people posted, and they're, they're uh, friendly pictures, that people posted, and they captioned it, and then, then they posted another one behind it that said, this is actually what happened. This is just the moment I got. So our first one is a dog. Okay, oh, so cute, at the beach, so nice. And they're like, this perfect day at the beach was the caption. And then the next post was what it was actually like. And then that picture, there's the, <laughs> there's the dog. Okay, yeah, we see dog soaking wet, probably got whoever took the picture soaking wet too. So the next one, we have a dining room table, super clean. And the caption was, excited to have dinner with the family. And then they posted five minutes before, it looked like this. <laughs> And so they take the time to clean it up, take the picture, and then we're good. And then you have this last one. He, he says he's excited to go on a business trip, uh, and he's excited to be flying again. And I think he said to England. And then in the next picture, he was just in his living room. And there, <laughs> at the toilet seat, right, yeah. So everything online is not what it seems, right? It's not always what it seems. And we know that. We see things, and we're like, that's a little hard to believe. But what's... What's different is in Instagram, you can, you can fake who you are, right? Some people call it catfishing, but let's not go that far. Let's say I only post the good things about my life, right? I only want to share what's good happening with me. I don't want to tell anybody about the negative. So on social media, that's probably okay. You don't want the world to know all your problems. But in church, that's not the case. If we show up week to week, and someone says, hey, how are you? And you say, I'm good. Or I love, I'm blessed and highly favored. Are you really feeling like that? Or are you just answering that because you don't want to get into the details? Are you just saying you're good even though you're supposed to be trusting your church family? If we treat our faith like we treat social media where we only share the good times, maybe only check in with Jesus once a week, are we really living out Christian faith to the fullest? As a group of believers, we are called to bear one another's burdens. In Galatians 6.2 the Apostle Paul asked the Christian community to actively engage in one another's lives, urging bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're going to read Galatians 6, 1 through 3. If you can throw that up there. There it is. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. We're not there yet. We'll get to, we'll get to verse 3. But verse 2. So my first point is sharing your burdens with others. Now, in America, that's really hard for us to do, right? Because we always want to be the perfect person. We want to portray the good side. We want to be the happy Christian, the joyous Christian if you read some of Paul, Paul doesn't seem happy all the time. He has joy in Christ, but he's not happy all the time, right? He writes from prison, and he's like, pray for us. We're in prison, but I'm still writing to you, and I still have joy that the Lord's going to deliver me. But he still tells people where he's at. When we as believers choose to have Instagram faith and only showcase the positive aspects of our lives, we inadvertently create a facade of perfection. This might come from a fear of judgment or vulnerability, but the reluctance to share where we are or what we're dealing with 
actually hinders our walk with Christ. Because we live behind this facade, and the more you lie to others about what's going on, the more you lie to yourself. So you show up to church, and you have this face that you put on, and you say, no, I'm good. I'm good. We have an altar call, and they're like, if you have any needs, you're like, (laughs) they don't need to know about that. So I'm good. I'll, I'll stay back. And then you go home, and you're like, man, I missed that opportunity. I missed out. What if I would have? What if? When we open up and share our burdens and victories with our fellow believers, we construct a community, a church that is grounded in support, understanding, and empathy. It's through sharing our challenges that we allow others to comfort and uplift us. Likewise, when we share our triumphs, we collectively celebrate the grace and strength that God bestows upon us. It's really cool when we have someone share, hey, I'm going through this, I need prayer for this. And then a year, two years, a month, God's timing, not our timing. They come back and say, it was answered. And the church celebrates. We've had that here where people have given testimonies and we're jumping and shouting because we've gone through it with them. But we don't know if you don't say. If you don't come up and, and at least confide in the person you're closest to at church, right? At least tell people at the altar. You don't have to tell them exactly what you're going through. Just say, I'm going through something with my family. I'm going through something at work. So we can be with you. So we can celebrate. Because if you don't share, sometimes if we don't share our triumphant story, we may not impact people around us. We've had uh, stories of how God moved and healed and some testimonies people specifically relate to because they're facing that exact problem in that moment. But how many times do we sit back when we see someone come up and say, my son was delivered in his back in, in, with Christ? And we sit back and we say, wow, that's awesome. And they're like, does anyone want prayer? And we're like, I'm not going to go up, but Lord, if you could do that for me, or uh, you know, I'll pray about it on my own, which is okay, do that. But come up and let us as believers bear the burden with you and go to the cross with you and pray and seek. How many times do we sit back and not answer the call? How many times do we complain that God did something for them and not for me. Christ not only calls us to pray, but as a body of Christ, we are to bear one another's burdens. If you were meant to walk life alone, Eve would not have been created, right? It would have just been Adam, and it would have been Adam forever. But that's not, that's obviously we're here, so that's not how that works. We're meant to talk to one another. And that can be your spouse, that can be uh, your pastor, but there's a lot of people here, right? We were like, 350s or so attendance. So if everyone goes to Pastor Stan, I, he might be a little overwhelmed. So maybe we're supposed to you know, do what Paul says and talk to each other. God didn't design humanity for us to be secluded. He designed us to have social interaction. This means that in our weakness and our brokenness, we can go to the church, to New Life Assembly, and know that no matter the circumstance or issue or sin, there are people that will stand with us in the valley and cry out on our behalf when we cannot. So, funny thing, Pastor Stan preached this morning, right? So he told me, he gives me a list of what he's preaching. And he's like, if you want to do a song that's related to this. So for this, he gave me, you know, his, like, I'm, the whole month I'm going to preach on First Peter. So I was like, okay, I don't know what goes with that. I'll read some stuff and I'll match some stuff, but okay. Uh, he didn't tell me what sections he was preaching on, right? So then he says, hey, do you want to preach on the 8th? And I was like, sure, no problem. So I had this whole, I was praying about it, had this sermon laid on my heart. I did not tell him what it was about. I didn't even tell him the title because I thought he'd be scared. Uh, (laughs) Instagram faith, uh, you know. Um, So he preaches this morning, and it's when you're going through trial, God-ordained trial, dealing with it and how you deal with it at church and getting people who you know to come around you and pray and being purified through it. I'm like, Lord, I'm preaching the second half to that. If you're going through God-ordained trial and you're facing something, we want to gather around you. We're going to do that tonight. I mean, spoiler alert, we're going to do that tonight. But it was awesome how how God lined up something he wrote however many months ago because he he likes to pre-plan. And he lined it up for tonight to match this. So I don't know who's going through it today, but somebody's got to hear it. So here we go. You're going to hear it twice. All right. In Philippians 2.4, the Apostle Paul writes, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We're going to read Philippians 2, 1 through 8. The verse I'm going to highlight is 2.4, but we're going to read the whole section. 
Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit, as your hearts tend, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be sh- selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equally with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Paul is reminding us the essence of Christian living. Point number two, bearing the burdens of others. It's a shift, it's a call to shift our focus from the narrow confines of my problem, me, 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 to the broad horizon of compassion and empathy towards others. The message is clear. We're not to be consumed solely by our own desires, needs, and ambitions. Instead, we are to have a genuine concern for those around us. This is a challenge because in America especially, it's all me, 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 me. You go on Facebook right now and you scroll and there's like one thing from your friend and like 11 ads in a row. And some of the ads, you're like, that's pretty good. They know me, you know? You're like, I kind of like that cup or I like that t-shirt. I saw, I like pumpkin spice lattes and I've been going to the gym. And I sent it to Lee when I saw it and it said pumpkin spice lat day. I thought that was hilarious because it's lats, you know, and it's pumpkin spice. I was like, that's awesome. So I sent it to Lee. And then I realized this is a Facebook ad that I'm scrolling through, sending to somebody. I'm doing what they want me to do, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm falling into the trap. So this is a shift that takes our perspective and demands our hearts to be in tune with those around us, not just what we need, not just what we're focusing on, but the people around us. What do they need? He also mentions and tells us to be more like Jesus, to mirror the life of Jesus. Jesus embodied this principle through his entire earthly ministry. He healed the sick many times, He comforted the brokenhearted, and he dined with the outcasts, right? Jesus was with people who no one wanted to be with. He touched people who people said you can't touch. He was with people that everyone cast aside. He talked to people that was out of his social status that he shouldn't have talked to. Ooh. (laughs) All right, I'll let you, I'll I'll say that one more time. He talked to people out of the social status that he wasn't supposed to talk to. Okay, his life was a testament of sacrificial love and concern for the well-being of others. So when people present a need or struggle, we're not supposed to cast them aside. We're not supposed to say, well, you know, you're too, you're too old for me to go pray for. You're too young for me to go pray for. Your need's too small or your need's too big. I don't know how to handle that. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus either stood there and listened, extended a helping hand and pulled him out of the water, or he healed him. But always he prays, right? So, so sometimes he'll, he'll move, he'll do a miraculous healing, just, you know, mud in the eyes. But he's always interceding for us. And so I think something we could really learn from that is not just how to act, but what to do. Where do we run to first when someone comes to us for a need? Are we trying to say, well, my experience says you should just quit your job, you know? Life's hard, nah. No, that's probably not the best advice. We should say, well, let's go to the Lord together. Let's get a group of people that are strong in their faith, that know what their walk with Christ is and can step with you and walk with you and be alongside you. And it's not just the one moment that happens at the altar, right? If that was the case, we could all go to a different church every week and it would be exactly how it's supposed to be. But that's not what God calls us to do. He tells us to be part of a church family, right? Because what happens is we see each other here at the altar, we pray, And then when I come back Wednesday or Sunday, depending on when we see you again, we say, hey, how's it going? How's life? Are you still moving forward? Are you still walking forward? That's where it's tough. That's where it's hard for the person that steps out and says, this is what I'm going through. Because you got to know, as family, if you're a parent, you don't just teach a lesson one time. (laughs) I'm learning. I have a three-year-old. You teach it a lot. And... That's how we show love, right? That's how Christ shows love. He shows it through correction. The Holy Spirit will convict your heart. And that's most of the time why we come to the altar if it's about sin. But other times, if it's about healing your family, are we following up? As the people who are helping them bear the burden, do you have their phone number? 
shocker, they probably do like text messages and saying like, hey, how's it going? Or I have a doctor's appointment on Tuesday. Cool, I'll see you Sunday. Like maybe text them Tuesday and say, hey, how's it going? I'm praying for you right now. That, up, that uplifting or encouraging word can really just change someone's day. Paul reminds us that we are not isolated believers pursuing our faith in solitude. In Romans 12, 5, Paul says, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. In this verse, the body serves as a metaphor for the church, right? The body of believers. Just as a human body has hands, legs, feet, heart organs, the body of Christ has its individuals made up, each with their own gifts, abilities, talents, and roles. So some of you might have the gift of prophesying, the gift of healing, the gift of encouragement. Some of you might not. <laughs> That's okay. We're all part of the body, right? We're all, part of, we're all part of the body. We're designed to be where we are right now as, in such a time as this. So find out where you fit. I'll tell you where you can always fit is praying for someone at the altar. That's where you can always fit. If you're secure in your faith, you can come up and pray because we need it. They need it. We need it. They need the prayer. We need the practice, as uh, Pastor Jeff used to say. And I, I think it's true. Sometimes we, we're scared to step out, you know. We're like, well, I'm, I'm going through something. And it's not what's called on the altar, you know. Some, someone's called up, if anyone for healing. And, and we're like, well, I'm not, I don't need healing, but... You know, I'm facing uh, salvation with my kids, and I, I don't, I don't want to go up and pray for somebody right now. I want to experience my own moment right here in solitude. Well, maybe God's calling you and urging you, and you're having that thought because the enemy wants to hold you back from coming up and praying for somebody. Maybe they need your prayer just to hear it. Not that one extra person is the answer. We don't know. But maybe they need you right in that moment to be that person. Maybe you're the person that's going to connect with them. We got guests coming to the church left and right. Like this morning we had a ton. And when people come to the altar and they're surrounded by a church family who loves them, that is awesome. This morning was amazing. I don't know if you were here, second service, two people gave their life to the Lord. And they were surrounded. Yes, let's clap. They were surrounded by people who prayed and seeked and loved on them. And that's what we need if we don't have that, they come up, have an experience, not a change, and then they walk out. But they need people that will stand beside them and behind them and hold their hand and walk with them. Paul, I said that. We are intrinsically connected, forming one body in Christ. Our interconnectedness reflects God's design for unity and cooperation within the church. We are not called to operate independently, but function collectively each one of us is indispensable and contributes to the health and effectiveness of the whole body. So if you came to the involved class, here's a short little excerpt. You have a gift, right? You're here in this church. You have a gift that you can give to this church. When you are not here, not only do you miss out on hearing awesome singing, right, and then uh, pretty, pretty good sermons, no, really good sermons, uh, but you also, we don't get to experience the gift you bring. Maybe that's the day we need an interpretation in tongues and that's your gifting. And it's not here and we miss out. So there's a, come to church. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we are called to celebrate each other's victories and share in each other's sorrows and lift one another up in prayer. Just as our physical bodies work in harmony to maintain health and vitality, so we must strive for unity and harmony within the body of Christ. If your hand is hurting, normally you go try and fix it, or you don't use it, or you wrap it, or something. If you got a, a tummy ache, some Tums, okay? You, you take something if, if you're hurting. If one part of the body of Christ is hurting, shouldn't we all gather around and pray for them and lift them up? So this brings me to my, my landing of the plane, okay? Here we go. Uh, Josh Hunter was here. Oh, he's running security. He's in the back. Say hi to him. He preached a sermon in youth uh, a few weeks ago that stuck with me, and when I was writing this, it stepped on my heartstrings, we'll say. And uh, so thank you, Mom, for inspiring the first part, and Josh for inspiring the second part. Uh, so I'm going to read Luke 5, 17 through 26. You probably know the story of the paralyzed man, but we're going to read it anyways. 
One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? It's easier to say your sins are forg- is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with the great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. Cool story. Love it. If you've seen the chosen version of this, also really cool. Seeing it thematically played out, pretty cool. Maybe they didn't have enough extras because when it said all the men from Judea and Galilee, that's got to be a lot of people. But his affliction was physical, right? So he was paralyzed. So he couldn't go by himself to see Jesus. We don't know if he said to his friends, hey, Jesus is coming into town. I want you to take me. We don't know. What we do know is his friends had faith, right? His friends carried him. I don't know how many people. I'm going to assume three or four because lowering someone from a roof, that takes a lot of physical work. Maybe it was his idea. Maybe they knew Jesus could heal him and heal what no physician could heal. They tried to go in through the front, right? They try to walk in, and they're like, here we go. It's blocked. When we're battling something, when we're facing something, and there's something standing in our way, Right, And you know when, something, when you're praying, when you're seeking after the Lord, and you feel that pause or that flesh step in and say, or that cell phone ring, and you're in your moment of prayer and, and someone's calling you up, maybe it's time to go higher, right? So they, didn't, they tried to go in the front door and they couldn't make it. So instead of giving up, setting him down, walking away, they pushed through into the crowd and went up onto the top of the house. So they, uh, yeah, I was, I was supposed to make a joke there, but I missed it, but it's fine. Uh, so they took him up to the roof <laughs> and found that they couldn't fit him through. As Mark 2, 4 says, I love this one, uh, it's a different translation, they tore the roof off. Is that one up there? It's not up there. I've, that's my fault. They tore the roof off. So it's a tile roof. Either they're digging through it or they're ripping it apart, right? That's physical, Okay, I don't know if you've pulled tile apart. And back then, sure, it's not the same kind of tile we have. But they're still getting, literally, setting them down, getting down on their hands and knees and ripping tile. They're taking time to do this. They're also maybe creating a little problem for whoever's house it is. But in the moment, they're trying to get to Jesus. They're doing whatever it takes to get to Jesus. So they lowered him down directly in front of Jesus. Now, I I was also going to ask some people to come with a mat and some rope and lower me down. And I was like, I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to embarrass me. We're going to just talk about it, okay? So if you can imagine a paralyzed man is being lowered down. We don't know how tall the house is, but we can assume if they went up to the roof, it's at least eight feet tall or so. So they're lowering him down. They cannot just drop him. Otherwise, it would have said Jesus healed him from his fall and from being paralyzed, but it didn't say that. So they had to lower him down, right? So that takes physical effort. They ripped the roof off. They carried him up to the top. They ripped the roof off, and they lowered him down gently. We're going to say gently. So sometimes when we have problems, when the way gets rough, sometimes we give up too easy. Sometimes we don't press in. Sometimes we don't take that time. We're praying and we're like, Lord, I I touch this person. I want deliverance. Or if we're going through something, we'll say, Lord, just take it from me. And he's he's saying, are you offering? You want me to do the work or are you going to do some work? You want me to take the burden or are you actually going to release what you're holding on to? Are you going to work for it? Are you putting in the effort? People probably thought they were crazy. They not only carried him the whole way, they lowered him down. 
Then lastly, in Luke 5, verse 20, it says Jesus saw their faith, right? When they lowered him down in front of him, can you go to verse 20 for me? I know, I'm having you step backwards. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say seeing his faith. He said seeing their faith, right? Not just the man that's being cared for and set down in front of Jesus. He has faith, sure, he thinks Jesus, he knows Jesus is going to heal him, but he says seeing their faith, the ones on the roof letting him down, the ones surrounding him at the altar praying for him, seeing their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. 